Good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I please ask everyone to switch their electronic devices to silence so they don't affect the committee's work this morning. Item number one is declaration of interest. Can I invite Anas Sarwar to declare any relevant interest to the committee? Thank you, Chair. A pleasure to be on the committee and I have nothing of interest to declare. Thank you. Can I welcome Mr Sarwar to the Audit Committee this morning? Item two is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items four and five in private? Yes. Thank you. Item three is section 23 report, NHS in Scotland 2018. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Claire Sweeney, Audit Director, Performance and Best Value, Lee Johnson, Senior Manager, Performance and Best Value, and Kirsty White, Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. Can I please invite the Auditor General to make a short opening statement? Thank you, Convener. Today's report looks at how the NHS in Scotland performed in 2017-18. I've been highlighting the increasing pressures facing the NHS for a number of years, and they've now reached the point where decisive action is needed to secure the future of this vital service. NHS staff are committed to providing high-quality care, and patient satisfaction remains high, but the quality of care is under pressure. NHS boards met only one key national performance target in 2017-18 and performance against the targets declined. No NHS board met all eight targets and more people are waiting longer to be seen. The NHS is not currently in a financially sustainable position. NHS boards struggle to break even, relying on a mixture of brokerage and short-term measures to balance their books. Boards made unprecedented savings at £449 million last year, but they relied heavily on one-off savings and they are finding it harder each year. Cost pressures continue to intensify, with rising spending on drugs, high levels of backlog maintenance and continuing difficulties in recruiting staff. The focus continues to be on the short term rather than on planning for the longer term. The government's medium-term health and social care financial framework and the other measures announced recently are a welcome step. The detail of these will be important, together with the full impact of the UK government's announcement on NHS funding. It remains essential, however, to address the underlying challenges facing the NHS in Scotland. Transforming how healthcare services are provided will bring real benefits to patients, but there needs to be an urgent focus on the things that are critical to success. These include effective leadership, longer-term planning, and ensuring governance arrangements are clear and robust. Most important, without much more engagement with communities about new forms of care and the difference they can make to people's lives, it will continue to be difficult to build support among the public and politicians for the changes required. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I are happy to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much indeed, Auditor General. I'm going to start questioning this morning. Um, there seems to be a, a little um, discrepancy between um, what the, the report says and what the First Minister said on the um, health budgets in the Chamber at First Minister's questions on the 25th of October. She said that day when, when questioned that health boards are not facing cuts and that the health budget has increased in real terms by 7.7%. But I think your report quite clearly states that there was a 0.2% decrease in real terms um, in this last year. Auditor General, can you outline for us, have there been cuts to the health board or have there not? We try to um, address this in part one of the report, particularly on pages eight and nine. Um, and I think the answer is, um, it depends on the way that you define it. If I can direct your attention to paragraph eight of the report, um, what we uh, set out there is that between 2016-17 and 2017-18, the overall health budget increased by 1.5% in cash terms, which is a decrease of 0.2% in real terms when you take inflation into account. Um, that's the overall budget. When you break it down into revenue and capital, the picture is a bit different. So revenue funding for day-to-day -day spending e increased by 0.8% in real terms, which is 2.5% cash terms. But the capital budget um, reduced quite significantly by 23.5% in real terms. And that reflects to a 
large extent the completion of the new Dumfries and Galloway Royal Infirmary and the near completion of the new Edinburgh Sick Children's Hospital and the Department of Clinical Neurosciences. Mm -hmm. um, so in overall terms, there was a slight decrease in real terms, but the revenue budget went up slightly um, mm -hmm. in real terms. Mm -hmm. So it really, as well, looks a bit, um, is dependent on how you define it and perhaps which year you're looking at as well um, over, over the piece. But I think your report points quite clearly to an increasing demand on our health service. Um, can you give the committee a flavour? Do you think the boards individually are really feeling that financial pressure then and it feels to them like they're having to, like they have less money and they're making cuts? Um, I'll bring Kirsty White in in a moment to give you a, a bit more of a picture of that. But in summary, yes, we think it's it's harder and harder for boards to uh, manage their budgets and break even at the year end. And more and more of them are relying on short term measures to do that. Kirsty, could you flesh that out a little bit? Yes, of course. As the Auditor General says, boards, boards have been relying on short term measures for a number of years now. What we saw in the past year was a continuing intensification of that. So we give some examples in the report of the ways in which boards have been trying to break even in that past year. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, for example, things like moving capital to revenue funding and actually the reverse as well to try and um, make that break even, late allocations from government. Um, and a lot of that is, is non-recurring savings. And as we make the point in this report and have made the point in previous reports, boards have been increasingly using non-recurring savings to try and break even. And then that's all combined with intensifying cost pressures, which we set out in Exhibit 5 of the report. And happy to obviously go into more detail as, as questions come up about that. Mm -hmm. Alec Neil. Can I start the Auditor General? Because basically, I think the key message of this report is, as things stood, the NHS in Scotland is not financially sustainable. Now, since this work was done, obviously, we've had the announcement that by 2023 at a UK level, spending in health will go up by 20 billion a year south of the border, and there will be consequentials, and that, that will start next year. Have you had a chance to look at the impact of the con on your conclusions in this report in the light of the additional funding we should expect to get? I think I should start by being clear that the conclusion in the report is the NHS isn't current, isn't financially sustainable in its current form. Um, yes. I think that there um, are ways of transforming it to make it financially sustainable. Um, and you're right, we have also seen a number of announcements, including the UK budget and the consequentials that will come to Scotland from the funding announcement there and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance's um, medium-term financial framework for health and care, um, and some other announcements around um, brokerage and the removing the requirement to break even on an annual basis. Um, we are still waiting for the detail of some of that, and we'll yeah. continue to look at it. Um, I think our clear conclusion, though, is that those things will... Um, provide a bit of welcome breathing space, but they won't address the underlying challenges, which are really twofold. Um, first of all, as Kirsty has said, um, healthcare costs tend to increase more quickly than general inflation anyway. Um, and secondly, we do have an ageing population, which means we require different forms of health and social care in future from the sorts of things that the NHS was set up to do 70 years ago, which were much more about treatment and cure. Um, we show in the report that the NHS budget currently accounts for about 42% of the total Scottish Government budget. <laughs> Clearly there's a limit um, to the extent to which you would want or be able to continue increasing that proportion without crowding out other vital services like education, early years and the other things <coughs> that are important. Um, so the announcements that we've seen at both the UK and the Scottish level will help, but they're not a substitute for making the sorts of changes that we describe as being needed in this report. Can I ask, what, what would be the three most important changes that are required in order to get into a financially sustainable position? Um, I think there are three things that we have been um, setting out in this report and the report we published today on health and social care integration. Um, the first is very clear leadership at both national and local levels to make sure that the pockets of really good practice we see are being um, developed and spread more widely. Um, the second is uh, much better longer term planning for what it will cost and what investment is needed to get from where we are now to where we need to be. 
and the third is much better engagement with with individual people with communities with staff to build that sense of confidence that um, the services that we can deliver in future are not just a response to cuts but instead are a way of meeting people's needs better uh, than we're currently able to do would you include in that the need to <coughs> have an examination of the overheads i mean for example we now, if you include the 31 integrated boards, the 22 health boards, and now the three regional structures, we have 56 different organisations involved in the delivery of the National Health Service, excluding the substantial resource in St Andrews House and in other bodies like Mental Welfare Commission. So is there not an urgent need to look at that overhead structure? Because um, I think we would all agree that one of the problems of the health service down the years is every time they create a new structure, they don't replace it, they just add additional structures onto what's already there. Um, it didn't make my top three, which is what you asked for, but we do say in the report that the governance arrangements for health and care are increasingly complex. Now, there is clearly a cost associated with that, but beyond that, I think it makes it more difficult in some ways to achieve the changes that are required. Claire, do you want to talk a little bit about our concerns in that area? Yes, thank you. There's no doubt about it that it has become far harder to recruit to those senior positions, and part of the story must be that we are looking for a, a greater number of top teams than has been the case before. On page 26 of the report, we just give a few examples of more recent um, instances where it's been hard to fill posts at a senior level. It absolutely is a, an increasing concern. Yeah, and what's, what's the... I mean, the, the other key part of all of this is the exponential increase in demand, which we can expect to continue to see happening in the years ahead. Um, uh, you know, as well as looking overheads, is there not a need for a robust demand management strategy uh, as well? I mean, obviously integration is key, but we, one of the things that struck me as Health Secretary was we're not actually managing demand very well. For example, if we spent more on prevention, that should, over time, reduce demand on day-to-day -day services. I think I'd go back a step, step from demand management. We say in the report on pages 17 and 18 that actually trends in demand and activity aren't currently very well understood. Yes. So exhibit six on page 17 shows that um, the number of elective admissions fell last year, um, the number of um, new outpatient appointments fell, the number of repeat um, out, outpatient appointments fell. Nobody's very sure whether that's because those people are being treated better in a different setting or because boards don't have the capacity to provide the services that are demanded. Yeah. And without having that really clear picture, um, it's very difficult to manage the flow in hospital and obviously to plan what your alternative primary and community-based services might be that could provide a better service to those people. They're really important questions. Yeah. And ask Sarwar. <coughs> Alec Neil touched upon the, and, and you also mentioned the, the leadership aspect, and I'll maybe try and touch upon that later on if I get a chance, but I just wanted to ask a couple of questions just around the savings element. So the, the report makes clear there's been almost £450 million of savings uh, made by health boards. Has there been any analysis of what that split has been between an end to running costs and service cuts? Um, Kirsty, I think, probably knows more about that £450 million pounds than anybody else at the table, so I'll ask her to talk you through the, the big messages around it. Yes, I, I suppose savings are split into two elements, recurring, non-recurring. Recurring is essentially what we would see as, as typically efficiency savings. Those are the savings we'll make that you would see savings year on year through, say, service redesign. The main issue we've seen in recent years is is the quite significant increase in the non-recurring savings element. So the one-offs, for example, selling buildings, for example, um, that is a sign of the cost pressures the boards are under and, and the difficulties they're facing in terms of, of finding savings. And also that's reflected in the increase in unidentified savings that we've seen at the start of the years as well. That's also been increasing where boards are unable to identify at the start of the financial year exactly what savings they're trying to make. So the, the key element of all of this is that increased level of non-recurring savings. And, and we've said this year, and we've said for previous years, that that level is not sustainable. Um, you, is this on the, the finances? Yeah, finances. OK, um, and then I'll come to Colin. No problem. Um, you also mentioned about the um, challenges around um, it being made clear to boards that they didn't need to break even at the end of the year. 
there's also been the, the writing off of the brokerage. Do you think there's a risk of, um, first of all, uh, appearance of rewarding bad behaviour for those boards that did manage to manage their finances compared to those that didn't and having their brokerage right, signed off? Uh, and also whether there's a risk of further chaos in future years given that boards no longer need to worry about breaking even at the end of the year? Um, I've been um, recommending since I took up this job that the health service should move away from a, a very sharp focus on annual financial balance, which I think makes it harder to um, achieve long-term financial sustainab sustainability. So I'd welcome the move in that sense. Um, we are still looking to understand fully how the new requirement to break even across a three-year period will work in practice. Um, and while for the boards who currently have outstanding brokerage, the write-off will be welcome. Uh, for boards like Tayside and Etcher and Aaron who have significant brokerage, they currently have no plans to repay the money anyway, so it's mm. not making an immediate difference to their financial standing. Um, as I said in response to an earlier question, I think all of those moves are welcome in that they give a breathing space to boards that are facing um, real, real financial pressures, but they actually don't help to address the underlying challenges, and it's important that that space is used um, to get the underlying sustainability back in order. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions on governance and uh, leadership, but first, just a, a general one. Page 23, key message 3, says that the healthcare system needs to become more open and people need to take part in an honest debate about the future of the NHS. Who are these people? Who do, who do you envisage being the people? I, I, think it's, I think it needs to take place at a number of levels. Um, we, if you talk to any doctors or nurses across Scotland, I think they will absolutely recognise that the health service needs to change to meet the needs of an ageing population. Um, fewer people need to go into hospital to be treated and cured for something. Many, poor, many more people need support for long-term conditions like diabetes or um, uh, pulmonary diseases um, or simply the diseases of getting older and more frail. So there's wide consensus that the government's vision is the right thing. Um, but changing health services is difficult. People are very attached to their local hospitals, the services that they know. And it's much harder to see the flexible community-based services that don't have a building attached to them and don't have that history. So I think we're looking for people to be involved from the national level with um, government and the national uh, clinical organisations talking about the sorts of changes that um, need to happen and that can improve services. They need to happen at health board integration authority level, and they need to happen at the very local level um, around individual GP practices and individual communities. Um, now, that's not something which is a quick fix. It does take time. But it also, I think, needs much more openness about why change is needed and about the way that it will be funded and managed over a period of time to help to build that confidence that it's not just about cuts. I think your scope of what the people is is probably fairly challenging to actually achieve. It's all of us, and I think this is a, a very challenging um, transformation that's required, but there's no substitute for it. Still in relation to that, in paragraph 77, you say there continue to be many examples, many examples of public and political opposition to attempts by NHS boards to change how services are delivered. Now, I don't know what your definition of public is in relation to that, and I'd appreciate some sort of definition. You say political opposition, does that mean local councils, local councillors are intervening to prevent it? Um, it I think, it, again, it's politicians at both local and national level. Um, we can all think of examples across Scotland of proposals coming forward from health boards to uh, transform the way services are being provided. Um, we um, very often see grassroots campaigns against those perhaps in some instances, because the engagement hasn't been done well um, and people don't understand either why change is needed or what's being proposed in its stead. Um, and we often see those campaigns attracting support from local and national politicians. Now, I think we all understand why that might be the case, um, but it also can be a really significant block to being able to make the sorts of changes that would not only help with financial sustainability, but that I think clinically are seen to be better services for the longer term. This is something that goes back um, decades in Scotland and more widely um, but I think because of the intensity of the pressures the, the health service is facing it's becoming more and more important that we start to open up those um, conversations and um, look at ways in which services can be changed to make them sustainable for the future. Just looking at governance and governance to me is the, uh, really the board of the local uh, organisations 
you've, you've been fairly harsh in commenting about uh, the difficulties in filling these positions, and certainly this committee in the past has discussed uh, with some concern some of the quality of uh, members of the boards of these various organisations. Um, you're talking about delays in appointments. You're talking about uh, how effective they are. How do we change this? I mean, there, there, there's a huge demand for non-executive directors across Scotland. And it seems to me that what you're saying is there is not sufficient supply to meet that demand. If that is the case, how do we change the model to compensate? I'll ask Lee to come in in a moment around executive recruitment, because that's also a challenge. Um, I think probably we need to look at both the, the demand and the supply side. Um, Alec Neil asked about the number of bodies that we have involved in this. Um, it is obviously the case that the more bodies we have, the more difficult it becomes to recruit people of the right calibre and experience to do the jobs uh, that are needed. Um, and at the same time, the jobs themselves, I think, are getting more difficult, both in terms of the scale of the challenge and the political, um, with a small p, climate in which people are working um, and the extent to which they're seen to be very difficult jobs to achieve in practice. None of that's helped by continuing pressure on public sector pay um, and the sorts of changes to pension taxation that we've talked about in this committee before. Lee, can you add a bit of colour to that? Uh, yes, I think um, in terms of leadership, and we do say in our report, um, I think there is work to be done to better understand why some of the particularly chief executive positions are difficult to fill. Um, I wouldn't like to uh, speculate about that, but I know that the government are also undertaking uh, work around their LIFT programme, um, which is about developing leadership um, and talent for the future. Um, and they are progressing that they have a number of uh, people currently on um, various courses who will leadership side as opposed to the governance side yes that's that's to become executive directors yeah. within the health and care system yeah thank you convener good morning um i'd actually just like to follow on from a couple of the uh lines from earlier first of all so alec neil talked about the number of bodies just a a very blunt question, if I may, Auditor General. Have we got too many acute hospitals for the population size and geography in Scotland? Um, there are people better equipped than I am to answer that question for you. Um, but I think the government strategy, again, over a long period of time, not, not just um, the, the current government, um, has recognised that um, the, the things that acute hospitals need to do are... Um, an increasingly small proportion of the overall demand on health and care as the population ages, um, that as technology increases, um, the need for specialisation increases with that, and that's one of the drivers for regionalisation in the health service that we're seeing at the moment. And there's then a really important job to do of understanding what demand looks like in each area of Scotland and how that plays out into the balance between acute hospitals and much better community-based services that can avoid unnecessary admissions, treat people close to home and get them home from hospital more quickly when they do need to be admitted. Um, I wouldn't say we can answer the question that we need fewer acute hospitals. We can say we need fewer people being treated in acute hospitals when they could be treated as well or better in their own homes. And if I may I move on from Colin's governance point. So uh, there are cl quite clearly huge challenges uh, ahead for the service, uh, as you've laid out in your report. And so the boards are going to need to be very high quality. Uh, it, it would appear that that is not consistently the case. Uh, and I'm looking at paragraph 71 of your report, uh, which says that there's no consistent approach across the NHS to ensuring that uh, the board is going to be of that level of quality. Uh, and that you also reference at paragraph 72 um, that the Health and Sport Committee did some work uh, which suggested that even the boards themselves don't generally think that they have the skill sets required. Uh, so what more needs to be done? And by whom? Claire, would you like to pick that up? Absolutely, thank you. So in the report at paragraph 71, we do set out some of the issues that we found through this piece of work um, about the ability of boards to take, to take on, to tackle all of those challenges that we've set out in the report. And we set out a number of issues in there that need to be addressed. So things like um, really understanding the skills that are around the board table, 
um, identifying where people do have additional needs that need support, <coughs> additional support, training and development, assessment for board members uh, to help them to do a good job. Um, so some of that needs to be done centrally. There's absolutely a job there for government. Um, we've also indicated at paragraph 73 some of the other factors that might get in the way of board members doing a good job. Um, so we've seen examples of things such as um, board papers which are incredibly lengthy, 600 pages of reports, the time board members have to go through some of those reports, non-executives been asked to review all of that to help inform decision making. Very, very challenging, particularly given the context, context that they're operating within. So we see real scope there for additional support to make sure that boards do have the skills, experience, time and the information they need to help inform good decision making. Additional support from whom? So there's a role for government here. Absolutely, there's a role for government around that. Um, I think there are, is also potentially scope around um, support across the, the non-executive group, for example, to support each other. We, we know that they come together to get training and support for new non-executive members on all public bodies in Scotland, and there may be scope for, for some more joint work between the kind of, the, as a peer support group, but yes, there's definitely scope for government to support, to support more. Mm -hmm. And it, just talking about that, I think Claire Sweeney, you're getting a, a kind of collaborative approach across the non-exec uh, field. Uh, we in this committee tend to see examples where boards have not perhaps performed quite so well just as a, as a function of what we're here for. Presumably there are a number of boards who are, you would say, uh, in your investigations of them, that are performing well, do have quality members and uh, would be exemplars of good practice. Are you able to highlight any of those and are they being able to share that knowledge across the estate? So yes, there are there are examples of particular issues that certain boards deal with very effectively. Um, I, I would say that that differs from board to board. Um, there's absolutely a place um, for government to think about sharing that good practice more effectively, what a good board looks like, how that operates, lessons learnt, particularly linked to some of the issues that we've drawn out in this report, where there are challenging decisions that need to be made. So, for example, the degree of openness um, from boards in terms of showing how their board is performing, how they engage with their local communities to help make some of those difficult decisions about the future. That is variable across Scotland, so absolutely there's scope to do more to share that good practice. Absolutely. Claire Sweeney, is government doing enough to facilitate that? There's more to be done. Okay. And ask Sarwar. I wanted to turn to the uh, workforce issues. I think it's um, often easy to focus on the financial issues, but actually in terms of day-to-day -day running of the NHS, uh, workforce challenges are, are, a, are a massive issue. We often hear every time workforce challenges are raised, uh, a response from government that we have more staff than ever before. Um, is that the right measure? Um, <clears throat> we've done uh, a range of work on the NHS workforce, and particularly workforce planning, given how critical that is to the NHS's ability to provide the care and support we all depend on. Um, it is true that there are more staff working in the NHS than ever before, and that's not surprising given we're spending more on the health service and activity levels in general are rising. Um, I think the real challenge is um, making sure that we um, are thinking not just about how we fill the vacancies that are likely to arise, but what the workforce that is that the NHS and care services will need in future as these sorts of changes come through. Um, and the work that we've published so far has found that that workforce planning tends to be much more focused on the supply side than the demand side of the equation and really isn't taking that step back to say if we're reducing our reliance on acute hospitals and providing much more care near people's homes, how, what does that mean for the roles of doctors and nurses, allied healthcare professionals, care workers and so on? So, so would, you, would you accept that the current workforce planning hasn't allowed for a staff base to meet demand um, and that um, the workforce planning that has happened today in terms of three separate publications of different parts of workforce plan haven't led yet to a comprehensive workforce plan that one looks at all parts of the National Health Service uh, and secondly is an integrated plan that goes across all health boards and is a national strategy rather than individual health board strategies. 
We published a report a couple of years ago on workforce planning in the acute sector, and we've got a follow-up report due next year which looks at the rest of it. Um, and I think the finding of our work so far has been exactly that, that so far it's focused more on the processes by which vacancies will be filled, rather than stepping back and saying what's the overall demand likely to be and how do we best meet that. So, so far we've seen um, consultant vacancies are up, AHP vacancies are up, GP vacancies are up, uh, nursing and midwifery vacancies are up, um, long-term vacancies, unfilled vacancies um, are up. You, you mentioned quite rightly the risk of Brexit uh, in your report. Um, would it be fair to say that we have severe workforce challenges uh, in the, before Brexit, but there's a risk that that will be amplified by Brexit? Is that a fair assessment? Um, I think that's very much what the report says, um, that you can see in Exhibit 8 some of the workforce pressures in the NHS, and they are all increasing. Um, we set out um, on page uh, 21 before that um, the possible impact of EU withdrawal, depending on what the terms of the um, deal finally are. Um, and we're not alone in that. Um, we see that again across the UK, real pressures on um, NHS and care workforce, partly a result again of the ageing population. There are fewer young people coming out of schools and universities to fill the training places available. Um, and I think that just adds to the need to think much more creatively about what the demands of the future are and how we can provide the services that are required. I'm not sure if Claire or Lee want to add to that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the, the NHS is, is full of people who are doing a good job. They're dedicated to making sure that patients receive the care that they need in a timely fashion to a good quality. Um, I think some of the challenges in the future are, are related to EU withdrawal, related to difficulties in filling posts, but there's also a slightly different question to ask there, I think, which is, the extent to which there's a recognition services need to change, that will inevitably <coughs> lead to changes in terms of the workforce that are needed to do that. So the jobs will be different, the roles will be different. Um, there's always been a question about flexibility, about generalists versus specialists. And I think some of those are really starting to gather pace now. People are starting to think through, well, what does it look like? Well, if we've got a different model of caring for people in our local communities, what, what staffing, what support do we need? What does that mean for social care services? So I think all of those challenges are things that um, locally the IJBs and the NHS boards and the local authorities are starting to try and think through. There is absolutely more work to be done around workforce <coughs> planning, but it's in the context of all of those bigger challenges, I think. Uh, the report also outlines uh, an increase in sickness absence, uh, an increase in, in turnover, and that looks specifically at the NHS. If you looked at social care, it would be significantly higher in terms of the sickness absent rate um, and the turnover rate. What do you put that down to? Um, is, is that a connection between the financial pressures, the staffing pressures, and then the impact that has on individual staff? Clear Sweeney quite rightly says our staff go above and beyond, uh, and that's not a question of the individuals working in our NHS, but, but what do you put that increase in turnover a sickness absence down to? So it's very difficult to answer because it will be different in different areas of, of Scotland. Absolutely, there'll be there'll be different things going on there. And we know that there's work underway to try and understand um, how happy staff are in their roles, what support they need um, to, to support them in doing quite often very, very difficult, difficult jobs. Um, we also know that one of the other factors that can, can have an impact here is um, rural issues. So in areas where um, there are very small populations, the model has to be different. You know, the, 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 the expectations on workforce is very different. We know that it can be hard to fill key posts in some of those more rural areas across Scotland. So there's a whole range of factors happening there. And we know that boards have different activities underway to try and support their staff around that. So the answer is, yes, there's still, there's still things to do there. Um, but the answers are very different depending on which parts of Scotland you're working in would be my sense of it. Thank you. And just one really quick question, Chair. Um, representative bodies have, have highlighted a concern that now when people leave posts, th there, aren't, there isn't advertising of that vacancy. Have, have you come across that at all and how that would impact on the vacancy rates? You were talking earlier with Kirsty White about um, non-recurring savings. That's one of the common ways that boards attempt to make savings is to delay filling a post when it becomes vacant. Now, that helps the financial position. It obviously doesn't help in terms of either providing services to the people who need them or um, managing the pressures on the remaining staff who are there. So does that mask the vacancy rate, you think? Does that impact on the vacancy no, rate? They're included within the vacancy rate, but it does affect the vacancies that have been um, empty for longer periods. And you'll see in the report there are some 
some quite high levels of long-term vacancies for doctors, um, for nurses and indeed for GPs as well. Thank you. Claire Sweeney, you talked about rural staffing there and when we were taking evidence on Section 22 report, we discovered that there were two locums in Caithness being paid £400,000 each locum doctors. Is that a financially sustainable way to fund, to fund our NHS? So what we've seen, certainly through this piece of work, is some of the more innovative approaches that have been taken in some island, some very rural communities. And I think the message is that the model needs to be different there. Um, so there's a job to do to think about what the services, what services are needed to support the local community, how you can build that in a sustainable way. Um, the, the mix of staffing, the focus of the, the, the way that those staff work might be very different in rural areas, but yes, it absolutely needs to be planned on a sustainable basis. But that 400,000 being paid to one doctor, it, I mean, are there any Scottish government guidelines on this? I mean, how far can we go in terms of... Uh, clearly, the, there was a need to get a doctor into place there, and the board felt it had to pay more. Is £400,000 a reasonable salary in the view of Audit Scotland? So there's an issue about making sure that um, the, the needs of the local community are being met. So whatever the service might be, the, whatever the context people are working within, there's a decision there to be made about whether the services are provided in that local area or whether there's a need to have more specialist services delivered in different boards. And we do see quite a lot of movement across Scotland where people will go to a different centre, a more tertiary centre, a specialised centre to get care. So I think, again, those are things that locally organisations need to be thinking through very carefully how do they work with neighbouring boards what services are they, are they able to provide on a sustainable basis in their local area and which parts need to be addressed through regionalisation which we know is starting to happen but there is more to do there. Auditor General it's our job in this committee to follow the public pound is it reasonable that we pay one doctor £400,000 to fill a rural vacancy? There is no doubt that £400,000 is an awful lot of money for any board and for any individual to be receiving. Um, I do have some sympathy that our remote and rural boards have to keep delivering services, and if they can't recruit staff um, in any other way, uh, they have to pay the going rate to be able to fill vacancies in the short term. In the longer term, as Claire said, it's imperative that they're looking at the way they provide services to make sure that it's making the best use of taxpayers' money at the same time as meeting the needs of the local population. Is £400,000 the going rate? It, it, I think what, what we see in these very remote areas is people where there is no alternative but um, an individual, sometimes working through an agency, um, who is being paid shift by shift across the year in ways that add up to a very significant amount of money. Across the piece, we see that the amount spent on agency staff and agency locums came down in 2017-18 compared to the previous year. I've got no doubt that health boards are trying to manage that down as far as they can. And we see these instances where they end up with no alternative if they're going to continue providing the service than to pay the rate that the market is demanding. None of us want to be in that position, but at the moment, without the longer term planning, the alternative is not to provide that service. The overall message of your report is that the NHS is struggling to be financially sustainable. Is this £400,000 salary to one doctor not a very good example of that pressure? It's an extremely good example of that pressure, and it's one of the um, one of the pressures that we pull out in the report as a whole. The um, challenge for the board, which I recognise, is that if they aren't um, willing to pay that amount of money, they have to pull back a service from a community in an already fragile part of Scotland. That's why this approach to much longer term workforce planning and to planning how the service can be provided is essential to, to stop that isolated example being more common across the country. Have you seen any Scottish Government guidelines on how high boards should go in terms of salary to get a doctor into post? I don't know if there are guidelines on uh, what, what a cap might be. I should do, there be? Um, I, I don't know. I think that there, there definitely are initiatives to try and reduce the reliance on agency staff in general and agency medical locums in particular. And we see the impact of that in a reduction of 10% on medical locums last year. Um, I, I think the solution is probably less about um, having a cap on the figure because that does run the risk of not being able to provide the service and instead on making sure that workforce planning is much more sustainable um, in future than it has been in the, the year just finished. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thank you very much, convener, and good morning. Could I just start by 
looking at the relationship between the money that goes into the health service and the sustainability of it in the long term, Auditor General. Um, your report on page 10, paragraph 10, shows quite clearly that there has been a real terms increase of 7.7 per cent over the past decade in spending and into the NHS. Only last week, the Cabinet Secretary announced an additional three billion would go in by 2023, and that exceeds even the Fraser of Allender's estimate to stand still. But from what I think you're saying in your report, it's not really all about money. Um, do you think initially that, that that kind of level of investment will help us to get financial sustainability, or is it much more than that that we need to do? There's no doubt that the recent announcements from the Cabinet Secretary, Secretary for Health and in the UK budget are helpful. Um, the, the immediate financial pressures have tightened in the last year again, um, and the announcements we've seen will build in a bit of breathing space to deal with them. At the same time, though, we know that the population will continue to age. That brings its own pressures. Healthcare costs rise faster than general inflation. Um, and we already spend 42% of the Scottish budget on the NHS. We can't keep on um, increasing that indefinitely. So I think what's critical now is to use the breathing space that that extra investment has bought to um, really give a, a boost to the speed at which the government's policy of um, providing much more care in people's homes or in community settings is delivered. That has to be the right way to go, not just in terms of financial sustainability, but to meet the needs of a population which is ageing and which expects different things from what our parents and grandparents expected. Um, but the pace at which it's happening isn't uh, fast enough to meet the, the pace of the, the pressures as they ramp up. I was going to, to ask about that in terms of when do you think it's reasonable to expect to see the fruits of the transformation process beginning to, to, to help us? Is it, is it too soon at the moment? You keep saying that it's urgent and we need mm. urgent action and leadership and, and all the, the correct topics that you've identified. But when do you think, God is general, it's reasonable for us to expect to see that transformation really having an effect? The government's policy, the 2020 vision, has been in place since 2011. Um, as the, the title suggests, the aim at that point was that it would be in effect by 2020. Now, that's clearly not going to be the case. We're now very close to 2019, and there's a long way still to go. Um, and that's why I think we're seeing the pressures on the NHS and on social care that we are. Um, we've published a report today on uh, health and social care integration, which is a key part of how government intends to deliver those changes. And we say in that that there are some um, indications of improvements, things like re reductions in delayed discharges, more people at the end of their lives spending uh, time at home rather than in hospital, which are very welcome. More importantly, I think they show that the changes can work. What's really needed now is, is for government, COSLA and the bodies involved to get behind that and start being much more systematic about how they learn from good practice and spread it, um, providing that leadership for making change happen across the country and, again, engaging people in, in why the change is important, why it's needed and why it's not just about cuts. We, we mentioned that, I think, again, convener, at a previous meeting, that the NHS can't do this on its own. The, there are various partnership arrangements, not, not least with the various councils, for example, in Ayrshire and Arran. There are three councils that are key players in that transformation strategy. Did you, do you get the sense that that's working as effectively as it, it should be in terms of this delivery? Yeah, you might actually say, such, such, say so in your report that you're talking about there, but uh, does that, <coughs> let, me, let me ask it another way, does the pace of that change need to accelerate and be much more quicker to, to, to deliver these benefits that we, we seek? The short version of today's report is that it, it varies. There are some really good examples, and it's not nearly widespread or fast enough. Um, and many of the things that we think are needed are the same things that I described in response to Mr Neil's question earlier. It can be done. It's not happening nearly fast enough to relieve the pressures that we're seeing in the report before you today. Last, last question then. I mean, your, your report says at the moment the NHS is not in a financially sustainable position. With this transformation strategy, as complete as we can get, get close to that, do you think ultimately that strategy will make the NHS in Scotland financially sustainable? Because if it doesn't, we need to think of something else, don't we? 
Um, we think it can do. Um, we've said in this report and in today's report that, that we do need that longer term planning, including financial planning. It may be that there's some pump priming investment needed in some areas of Scotland to get from the current model to where we need to be. Um, but all of the indications are that for the Scottish Health Service and much more widely across developing countries, that's the way of, of squaring the circle of increasing demand and changing expectations. We need to make it happen more quickly than it currently is. OK, thank you. Bill Bowman. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> In, I think, paragraph 67 of your report, you discuss the dual role of the Director General of Health and Social Care mm -hmm. and the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland. And in particular, it points out that, as Chief Executive, that person will be responsible for the day-to-day -day performance of the NHS <coughs> and for implementing Scottish Government health policies. However, as Director General, they will be responsible for holding the NHS to account for its performance and how well it has implemented Scottish Government policies. Now, whether or not there's a real conflict, there seems to be a perceived conflict there. How should that be handled? Um, I think the, the detail of how it's resolved is a matter for, for government, for the Cabinet Secretary to think through. Um, I do think that, um, A, it's a very big job, given the scale of the challenge, and B, there is this tension between running the health service as it currently stands and being accountable for its performance and thinking about how it changes in the context of integration, working with councils and a range of other partners. Um, there are clearly different ways in which it can be done, but I think... Uh, Combining the two roles in the one, one person makes it a very big and potentially a, a conflicted job to be carrying out in practice. So I would take from that that maybe they should be separated? I think that's one of the options, but I think that's very much for the Cabinet Secretary to be considering how what she other wants to deliver this. What other options would you suggest might be there? Um, well, we've talked um, in response to Mr Neil's questions about the um, way in which governance of the NHS and care has changed over um, recent periods. We now have formal statutory roles for the integration authorities alongside the health boards and councils. There's a question about where that accountability sits. Um, in, uh, in other places, there is a separation instead between policy and delivery. That's an option. There are options that could be considered here, which I think are all about thinking more seriously about the health and care system as a whole, rather than the NHS as one part of that. I mean, coming back to these, these roles, and you've spoken about the need for good leadership. Are we getting good leadership from these roles at the moment? I think they're very difficult roles to carry out, given the, the scale of the job and the, the scrutiny under which they come. Um, it's made more difficult by the number of jobs we need to fill, and we know they're increasingly difficult to fill. All of that's making it harder. Claire, would you like to add a bit to that based on the work you've done in this area? So I think partly the, um, the answer as to why they're difficult to fill is exactly those points, all of the issues we've been talking about It's not to fill the role, today. but how it's being executed at the moment. Okay, so absolutely there's variation in how those roles are being, are being fulfilled at the moment, for sure. And it is very difficult to build all of those very good senior teams, given the number that... So this is one be. person at the moment who's doing both roles? Sorry, you're asking about the... Clarity here. I think... Ms Sweeney's talking about chief executives and health yeah. boards, and I think you're talking about the chief executive of the NHS in Scotland. Um, Mr Bowman, can you rephrase your question just so Ms Sweeney is clear, please? So I was saying we have these two roles. Um, we've had comments about leadership and the need for good leadership. Uh, so I was asking whether this, these, this, these two roles, and perhaps one individual, is giving good le leadership at the moment. So the messages in the report, in this report and in the report around integration, which highlight the challenges and the things that are working and not working in the system more generally, apply equally to, to government as they do to the rest of the system. So the challenges for that senior leadership team in, in the Scottish government around this policy area, the messages in the report about the need for... Um, the need for clarity about what is trying to be delivered and the um, the difficulty in recruiting to some of those top leadership posts. So I'm not answering the question about that post particularly. I'm talking about that top team at government. Some of those challenges equally apply there as they do to the rest of the, the boards that we've been looking at through this report today. I was just trying to get a view as to whether the top leadership here is, is working. It's entirely fair to ask what it's gotten that, the, that question, but I, I think we've had a good go at, at answering that. I'm going to move to Alec Neil. I just want to quickly come back to the, the questions asked by the convener, because we touched on this the last time we discussed the National Health Service, about, in this case, the two individuals in the, the Highlands getting £400,000. Can I just clarify, does that include the agency fee 
Because I think you were going to send us... We are going. We are drafting a letter. We are still in the process of uh, trying working with the board to understand. They have sen sent us some figures, but we didn't uh, feel it was clear enough. So we are just <coughs> seeking further clarification, and we will get a letter to the committee. So it's a fairly, Very soon. I'm not blaming you, but it's a fairly simple question. How much did the doctors get and how much did the agency get? Because uh, these private sector agencies that I tried to do away with when I was the Cabinet Secretary, they are they are a bunch of rip-off merchants of the first order. And it's ridiculous, the fees that they're getting. So I think that's quite important. I mean, it's bad enough that we're paying £400,000 for jobs that are not worth anything like £400,000. And I think we also maybe need a better understanding of why the Highland Board felt the need to pay that level of funding for locums. Uh, now, I have fully, having been the Health Secretary, I fully understand the challenges and I'm not suggesting it's easy. But I think can Audit Scotland supply us with more details fairly soon, both in the agency fee and any other costs associated with that, as well as more detail of the circumstances and what the health board tried before they reached the decision they needed to employ two people at £400,000 plus agency fees, presumably. We, c we can seek that additional information and, and put that in the letter that we have agreed to, to get yep. back to you. What's the time scale for getting that information to us? Clearly you've started that work, but... Yes, we yeah. have. Um, we're just waiting on a response from the board. It would just... The, the, the agency fees are on top of the salary. Um, that's clear. What we're just trying to clarify is exactly how much that agency fee was. I think your response will be very helpful, but of course the committee can go straight to the board as well, which is something that we'll want to consider. Ms Johnson, in the information you have received so far, you must know which agency this is. Can you tell us that? I can't off the top of my head recall what the agency is called. Okay, so can you give us a timeline by the time we'll get this information? Uh, we're just, as I said, waiting on a response from the board, so I will uh, try and hurry that along when I get back and get back to you within the next couple of weeks. Well, two weeks, I mean, it shouldn't take two weeks. I mean, all it requires is somebody to look this up. It's basic information. I would have thought we should have that information by the start of next week. Two weeks is a ridiculous time to wait for basic information. Uh, I mean, they must have the information ready to hand. Let us hear what the information is and let us see how much money has been wasted on agency fees. We will convey the committee's urgency to Highland, to NHS Highland. Obviously, it, it's their information rather than ours, and we'll Absolutely. come back to you as quickly as we can. Yeah. I would remind the committee as well that we're still undertaking scrutiny of the NHS Highland Section 22 report, yeah. and this could be something that Absolutely. we raise in that scrutiny. Liam Kerr. Very briefly, if I may, Auditor General, on that point, just a bit of a daft laddie question, if you don't mind. Do doctors, do nurses, do, do healthcare professionals ever come out of practice and set up their own locum agencies to supply themselves back in to the NHS? Um, I think some of the uh, agencies which provide um, healthcare workers were set up by um, former nurses. Um, I'm, I'm aware of some former nurses and I suspect former doctors, um, but they tend to be larger organisations now because of the extent to which they can generate revenue from the health service. Um, we've reported on this as an issue in its own right in the past, that um, one of the risks of poor workforce planning um, is that there are incentives for people to work for agencies rather than for the health service um, in ways that are not in the public interest. It's why good workforce planning is so important. Indeed, thank you. And our Sarwar. Yeah, I want to turn orders general to the um, targets, um, or you could call them patient treatment standards. Um, the report makes clear that only one um, of the eight key performance standards has been met across uh, Scotland. Um, not a single health board has met um, all their standards. Um, the Cabinet Secretary, in, in response to the uh, report um, in the Chamber, said that the report didn't take into account the new waiting times improvement plan. I, I presume that is the case because um, you're not making an assessment on the future, you're making an assessment on the past and the, and the here and now. But we've heard af after previous uh, reports that there is a plan in place uh, from government to get to grips with the waiting treatment, treatment waiting times, but still year on year it's not happened, it's not worked. Um, is it safe to say that previous year's planning has failed? Um, there's no doubt that it's become harder and harder for uh, NHS boards to hit the eight 
key national standards um, over recent years for all the reasons we've been discussing. Um, and achieving that um, will remain difficult while we're seeing this sort of uh, combination of financial pressures, demographic pressures, and a focus on the quality of care, which we all understand. Um, we have also in, this, in our work reported, though, a concern that the national standards only look at one part of the health and care system. They focus very much on acute care and don't look at what's happening within uh, primary and community health services, let alone social care. And one of the messages that I um, have been trying to convey through our work is the need to look at the system of a ho as a whole to understand not just um, whether the uh, national standards are achievable, but what the impact of those standards are is on waiting for other parts of the system um, which can often be the answer to prevention and to reducing the pressure on the acute system. I agree on measures for, in terms of holistic care across mm -hmm. all sections of the NHS, but just focusing purely on the acute sector, this includes targets, for example, around cancer waiting times, and we know the earlier you diagnose, the earlier you treat, the higher chance you have of survival, so they're very crucial um, standards and targets. Um, they've got worse year on year for, for how many years? And um, secondly, do you accept that the actions that have been taken by the government to improve those treatment standards have failed? Um, the information on um, performance over a number of years isn't captured in this report directly. We have reported on it previously, and Kirsty may be able to help you with it. Um, I, th I think what we're seeing, though, is another example of the pressures on the health service. Um, and there is no quick answer to that, which doesn't involve looking at the system as a whole. Um, these obviously matter to patients. Um, you talk about the cancer waiting time standards, very important to the people affected. A&E waiting time matters to people for all sorts mm. of reasons. But if we are simply looking at the acute system, we're not looking at the opportunities for treating people at home rather than admitting to them, them to hospital, which may not be the best place for them and may break down their support systems and we're not looking at the investment that's needed to avoid unnecessary admissions or to treat people in more community-based ways which would be better for them and uh, meet their own needs better. <coughs> so you can't answer the question I think without looking at the whole system which the national standards don't do. And just on the treatment um, imp improvement plan, um, there is a three-year plan to get to the targets where they are set now. In, in future reports, will the report be measuring against the interim target set by the Cabinet Secretary or will it be measuring against the actual target, the actual standard? What we have um, tended to do in the past is to measure against both. So in the past, we've had the targets and the standards. We've tended to measure against both of those and provide that detailed information. That gives people a sense of the direction of travel as well as the, the performance in the year. Thank you. Again, very briefly, if I may, Auditor General, just in response to Mr Sarwar's question, you talked about the pressures on A&E. Um, I'm just looking at page 17 of your report. Uh, emergency admissions have increased by just less than 1% uh, in 2016 17 Now, given the figures here, and you'll appreciate I'm working very much on my feet here, uh, but that's only about 5,000 a year. Uh, and I think we've got 14 NHS boards. Uh, so very basically, that's about one case per day per board increase in A&E. Now, I appreciate it's damn lies and statistics because it's across. I'm going across the piece rather than uh, targeted. But nevertheless, that's not an enormous increase in A&E. Uh, and it's, it's fairly consistent. Thus, it can be planned for, uh, and thus, when you talk to Mr. Sarwar about waiting times, presumably, it can be addressed. Just to be clear, the figure in the exhibit on page 17 is emergency admissions, not A&E attendances. Um, so a lot of people attend A&E who are treated and um, return home or uh, treated somewhere else, referred somewhere else from there. So th there's a slight difference between the, the two things that you were touching on in your answer. Claire, did you want to add to that in terms of the, the national picture for emergency admissions? I think the, the general point which we, the committee might be interested to explore a little bit more in terms of the re integration report about the impact that integration is having more generally, because this is one of the areas that integration was intended to improve. Um, I was just reflecting on one of the, 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 the questions we've been asking ourselves when we've been looking at the data this year is um, the pattern of rising demand and a seemingly slower rate of increase in terms of throughput. So people coming into the system, being treated and coming out the 
other end. And, we've, and it's not clear why that's the case. We've been asking ourselves the question, does that mean that demand is continuing to increase, but actually the system's got as hot as it's able to get? So actually they're not able to get through some of the numbers that they were able to, to get through previously. So I think there's a whole load of interesting questions in there. And the only other thing I would mention is that we continue to find it quite difficult to get really good data around some of the things that aren't in acute hospital. Um, and we know that even for the data measuring things in an acute hospital setting, the, the definitions about what's counted, what's not counted, the focus, there's, there's a need to improve some of that. So, for example, understanding when people come to hospital with an emergency, how they're categorised, how that compares to what's happening in other hospitals. We've published reports in the past about accident and emergency activity, and we found it very, very difficult to be very specific about what that activity actually looks like in practice. So there's something around the data so that needs to be thought about here as well. And again, just if I may stick on that point, so going back to Convener's question from earlier, who should be leading that data capture? Is, is this, again, you said earlier, Claire Sweeney, that government has quite a big role here. Is this something where government should be stepping in and saying, we need better data? So there's absolutely a role centrally to think about how all of the boards capture that information, what categories they use, what the priorities might be. But again, it's not just for the boards to do. Um, increasingly, we see that the system is so interconnected IJBs have a really important role. You really need to understand, to a much greater degree, social care-related issues. Um, so yes, there's a job centrally to be done, but it's actually all of the agencies that need to work together. Um, ISD, who are responsible for a lot of these statistics, need to need to be involved in that conversation as well. So yes, there's a role centrally in terms of consistency and agreeing what the focus will be. But actually, it's now it's far more a partnership endeavour than it's ever been before. It's, I don't think it's possible to sit there centrally and say this is the answer we'll count x y and z to the exclusion of anything else i think there needs to be more of a collaborative effort there willie coffee and convener it was just what the general just to ask about public satisfaction mm -hmm. in the nhs and i can remember a previous report where you, you, you touched on that and it, and it was quite high then and i think it still remains quite high can, can you can you confirm that i mean despite the challenges and the pressures that we all know about public satisfaction with the overall delivery of NHS services in Scotland is pretty high. Yes, on page 20, we try to pull together what information is available about um, patient satisfaction. Um, and in paragraph 43, um, you're right, 90% of patients in the 2018 inpatient survey um, rated their care and treatment as good or excellent, which is similar to the 2016 survey. 91% um, of people were positive about their experience of hospital staff, which again is slightly up on 2016. Um, but there are some indicators that that's under pressure, as always in this. Um, it's that the, there's never a, a single straightforward picture. Um, the uh, percentage of patients rating the quality of care provided by their GP declined um, to 83% in 2017-18. Um, and people um, more generally felt they weren't getting the opportunity to involve the people close to them, their families and friends, in treatment where they wanted to do that. So it's a mixed picture, and we also know from, from surveys of staff that staff increasingly feel their time to provide the sort of care they want to um, is under increasing pressure. I think you can see that um, in the exhibit on... No, exhibit 8, thank you, Kirsty. Um, which gives you, again, that sense that people are doing their absolute best, but it's becoming more difficult to provide the quality of care that every healthcare professional would like to. What does that tell us? If people's satisfaction rates are very high, but we don't meet particular targets in a range of areas, what, what, what kind of message is that giving us? I, mean, I think it tells you it's complicated. We know people really value the NHS. We know that they recognise the efforts that most staff are going to to provide the best care they possibly can. Um, patient satisfaction in the NHS tends to be high almost whatever uh, the experience of people is on a particular occasion. Um, and it, it's becoming more difficult. It's a tribute to NHS staff that satisfaction rates are that high. And I think we can't expect the levels of uh, intensifying pressure to be maintained indefinitely. Something has to be done to address the underlying causes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There are a few worrying aspects of this report, Auditor General, but I was particularly interested in the estates. Um, you say there's a backlog maintenance of 900 million on page 16. 
but the capital budget has reduced by a whopping 32% over the last 10 years. Um, is this wise, given this level of needed maintenance in our hospitals? One of the main, main messages of the report, I think, is that we do need to see the government coming up with a clearer capital investment strategy to um, be able to make the changes that are required. I'll ask, ask Kirsty to tell you a bit more about the detail of the picture. C can I just um, yeah. clarify just what you said there? You said the government needs a clearer investment strategy, but in your report, paragraph 33, you said the Scottish government has not planned what investment will be needed. Do they have any kind of planning of capital maintenance investment that's that's needed in hospital and, and community health buildings? I think what's um, quite good in the health service is the survey of the condition of the estate and the investment that's required to maintain the, the estate as it stands. What we're not seeing is that strategy for what um, the estate, what buildings and, and clinics and so on will be required for a, a new type of health and social care in future. Um, and Kirsty can tell you a bit more about that if that's helpful. Thank you, Kirsty. Yes, um, I suppose the first thing to say is, is that the capital budget has always ebbed and flowed depending on key, key investments coming forward, such as big acute hospitals. Um, what's interesting is that... But the overall uh, trend is a cut in 32% yes, over the yes. last 10 years, is that correct? Even yes. despite your new hospital in Dumfries, Edinburgh and Glasgow? Yes, okay. yes. And, and what's interesting is that every year boards produce... a. Uh, um, they, they survey their estate and they have to provide a report talking about the performance of their estate and they have to provide a property manage, an asset management strategy. In that, they set out what they think they need their capital investment to be over the next five years. The most recent report on that stated that boards thought they needed £3.3 of planned investment over the next five years. Now, that's boards' own assessment and, and that's added together to come to that figure. Obviously, we don't know what the capital 3. budget... 3.3 billion. Yes, and we don't know... And two-thirds of that are acute, and then the rest is, is varying different assets. Um, obviously, what we don't know is what the capital budget will look like going forward. That's why we've said it's really important that the government has a national capital investment strategy. Scotland's fiscal outlook published in May predicted that the capital budget may remain relatively static. The NHS is obviously only one element of a number of other public sector um, services that will need capital. Therefore, it's really important that the new projects projects coming forward, the capital budget it is used strategically to, to, do, to continue to drive that change. Okay. I mean, Auditor General, if I understood you correctly, I think you said that the Scottish Government is aware that investment is needed just to bring our buildings up to a standard that are acceptable now, but there is no capital investment planning for what a future health service will need to be in terms of health and social care integration. Is that not really concerning? How are we going to be able to deliver that future service if we don't have the buildings and the infrastructure to do so? I think it's a really good question and it's a question for the government. Um, in a sense it has to be part of this um, more detailed strategic planning for what the health and care services of the future will look like in terms of the, what it will cost, what the workforce required is and what the um, capital investment required to get there. Some of the buildings we've got now may well be able to be used for a different type of healthcare in future. Some probably will not. We may need investment in uh, GP surgeries, in primary care health settings, in other things to be able to provide healthcare differently, including technology. Having that investment strategy I think is one of the really important um, things that are required to make progress with the 2020 vision and to get from where we are now to where we need to be in future. Thank you very much. Do members have any further questions that they'd like to put to the Auditor General and her team? Just pick up Briefly, where you yes. left off, Chair, which is, uh, as the Chair mentioned, how can you plan for the long term if we have such a high maintenance backlog just now, a £900 million maintenance backlog, 45% of which is... Um, high risk or significant. Um, what's the answer to that, Auditor General? I mean, how, how, what's the response to government to that? I mean, that, that's just a staggering statistic. 
I, th I think it is very much a question for government. Um, there is uh, no doubt that choices have to be made always between different priorities for investment uh, within health, within the NHS, within health and care and across the Scottish Government more widely. Um, we need to be balancing the investment we make in today's hospitals and clinics with what we need for the future. Um, and we need to be thinking about what impact prevention uh, could have if we go further upstream. Uh, so you do need to be looking at it in the round. Um, what we've done is give you a sense of the challenge that government's facing. Okay. Can I thank the Auditor General and our team very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now close the public session of this meeting and move into private. Thank you.